now you are in Saudi, yeah. So UAE, what I have become Yeah. So it is good. And so people from different sectors uh, with different experiences and very different kind of contribution, significant contribution, they are with us. We have Ramani Ayer, sir, who is a fatherly figure in our uh, ISA. And uh, there are many other uh, uh, maybe delegates and Villa Sitni, sir, just to say from ISA earlier from Mumbai. And uh, uh, CSIL, he works with CSIL Mumbai, and I expect Miskin sir also. Maybe later on, uh, I request Prophet sir, whenever uh, as per schedule it comes, he will acknowledge that presence. Now, I, I will uh, request uh, uh, initially Bangesh Kale sir to uh, have his keynote at the opening speech for this panel discussion. The theme of this is uh, to have robotic application in several different areas. For example, healthcare, agriculture, industry sector, in general uh, applications, uh, typically like uh, maybe field operated robots and all. And we, we want that uh, the topic has to be conveyed to a very common man who may be uh, the user of this robotics technology, even agriculture sector and all. Maybe I, I expect some farmers group to join whenever the time comes. So I request Mangesh Kare sir to open up the team with this presentation. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, so robotics per se is a very, very uh, huge area. And uh, all the possible applications and technologies of robotics uh, cannot be covered in uh, one webinar. Obviously, there are uh, uh, you know hundreds of courses, thousands of industries uh, that are working in robotics, and therefore I will focus my, uh, my address uh, only for the time being on what uh, we have seen robotics industry as over the past thirty years since we have started uh, PARI. A brief background of PARI in a minute is uh, we are the largest automation company in India uh, with over 1,500 people. We have subsidiaries in the US and in Germany, and we export to Europe, US, and of course, we are the largest automation company in India, uh, making, uh, you know, robotics and automation solutions. So, as for the way we see robotics is that mainly, of course, there are very, very diverse sectors that uh, robotics can be applied to. What basically robotics does is, you know, previously it was basically replacing human muscles. Uh, that was called as mechanization. And now it is no more as automation where the attempt is not only to replace human muscular power, but also human sensory perceptions and also partly human decision-making capabilities in the industry. And therefore robotics is becoming more and more advanced. And of course, then there are various tentacles that go in various aspects of life. For example, um, I mean, if you really see the application of robots, fundamentally, whatever domain may be there, it has to be a mass production that mainly requires robots as one of the aspects. Second aspect is whenever, whether there is mass production or not, but if there is production that is required with very high level of consistency, humans for humans it is impossible to do. And therefore, robots, which are uh, part sir, just, I just interrupt you. Can you just uh, switch on the video? If you want to see many participants. Okay. I hope you can see me now. Uh, yes, yes. Now I can. Yeah. You are looking very okay. handsome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. More like a professional. So, uh, at our uh, production, High consistency. That means if one piece is produced, pieces have to be produced identically uh, with the given quality so that the reliability significantly improves. That is the other area that robotics is deployed in. And the third uh, aspect for robotics uh, utilization is applications where humans just cannot do part of the work. That means if there are applications where it is impossible for human to, to have that kind of skill to perform that kind of operation, only then robotics is typically used. Now, uh, the largest application of robotics is in the industry. It's not there uh, in 
the, the maximum penetration in the industry. It is not as much in farming or it is not as much in any other sector compared to industry today, but that does not mean that it cannot be there. The reason that is not there is robotics works most effectively in structured environment, whereas most of the uh, areas like farming or, you know, uh, for example, moonwalking, I mean, uh, Mars Land Rover is nothing else but a robot, for example. They're very unstructured areas and the technology required for actually being able to utilize uh, effectively robotics into unstructured areas is extremely high. Therefore, it gets extremely expensive and therefore it doesn't become feasible in today's world, which is completely driven solely on economics and uh, nothing else. So coming back, mass production, production where high consistency is required and uh, applications where humans just cannot do a particular job uh, that you know only machines can do and robot is by the way nothing else but a machine but they're getting more and more and more intelligent at this point of time and they sometimes mimic humans so robotics is per se not for replacement of humans alone but replacement only of the replaceable human uh, interaction uh, with the world so humans can do higher level things that robots cannot do at this point of time so as I was saying, the engines, internal combustion engines, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, in engine, for example, you'll have crankshaft, cylinder block, cylinder head, camshaft. They're known as four Cs of the engine. And these components have to be machined. Now, machining process of camshaft, crank, uh, you know, crankshaft, block, and head are extremely complex processes. So one are uh, round parts like crankshaft, other are uh, prismatic parts like cylinder head, cylinder block, and so on and so forth. And the machining lines of these are typically about 300 meters long. And they produce each component at approximately a tack time of one minute to one and a half minutes per, per part. The, the production rate is that kind of production rate in powertrain. So powertrain machining is a very, very big application because the parts are heavy and the parts need to be loaded and unloaded and stored and all the manufacturing engineering in terms of buffering and line balancing has to be done. So for all the machining of these parts, robotics is used in a very, very big way. The next part is when you do all this machining, finally all these have to go and they need to get assembled to actually form an engine as an example. And therefore, what is some, there is another application of robotics which is pretty big, which is known as power drain assembly. Now the reason that this is done, this is, this is required to be done by robots, is humans virtually cannot do it. Today, as you know, the engines are Euro 6 graded in Europe, right? Or now we have BS6, BS6, BS6 in India. 
so what happens is when you are actually assembling the engine which is supposed to perform with emission standards and efficiencies that are required very very consistently at the first crank the engine must start so the, the components are very precise the machine using robotics for pick and place and cnc machines for machining and then all the components have to be assembled and at each station the assembly has to be checked as to whether this assembly has done has, has happened correctly or not and it is impossible for humans to check it because the uh, tolerances that you are talking about are literally in microns what for cylinder assembly for example the gauging and measurement uh, tolerance required is 1 micron human eye cannot see that human sensory perception cannot really measure that and therefore board and assembly is another big area where robotics is used the third area where robotics is used very significantly is painting uh, you must have seen that the quality of the cars that come out these days is absolutely superlative and the reason for that is the aesthetics is absolutely beautiful which goes in the body in white manufacturing as well as painting also painting is a dangerous operation because paints are inflammable and therefore safety of humans and the machinery is of utmost importance and therefore uh, for the safety reasons as well as consistency reasons where humans just cannot paint the equipment as good as uh, a robot can in volume and therefore painting is a very very uh, big application welding is another huge application for robots where body and chassis welding is very important important for two reasons obviously aesthetics is a part, big part in it but mainly safety is another big part of it. for example if you see railways the uh, bogie of the railway is a key load bearing element the uh, bogie bolster as they call it and all that has to be welded using robots because any defect can have disastrous situation and humans can do welding but robotic welding is always superior to human weldings in general and therefore uh, and also the welding is a very monotonous very very hazardous job and therefore in a huge way uh, in automotive body and chassis welding robotics is used and then there is limited application of robotics in the final assembly that is where all the components come in and assembly is uh, final car goes out there is automation there but of course what it what what is required more there is human assisted robotics uh, now when i say automotive of course wherever there is general mass manufacturing robotics is absolutely significantly deployed worldwide for example the manufacturing of air conditioners manufacturing of compressors whatever you call it wherever there is mass production and these processes like welding handling and so on robotics is very extensively used the applications of robotics have gone now further the reason for that is that the sensor technology and the mathematics that goes into robotics has enhanced significantly over the last decades and therefore significant robotics is now used in the food industry in multiple ways i mean simplest application for example is if you have bags of rice or wheat or eggs or whatever it is cartons of eggs and you need to pick place and palletize these cartons for sales and distribution in that particular case robotics is very significantly used but now it has penetrated deeper where, where wherever there is automated food food manufacturing like maybe fish cakes or so on and so forth um, the customers don't want that food to be touched by human hands and therefore in the food industry robotics is very significantly used where all these material that comes in which is processed food pick and place and packaging of that by in, including inspection vision based inspection for robotics is a big deal we have supplied some equipment like that also in india as a matter of fact um, the next application is nuclear industry aerospace testing and industry uh, in aeroplane manufacturing robotics is not very significantly used simply because uh the mass production you know the uh, volume of production is not that high but of course if you talk about seats of the airplane then obviously robots will be used because the quantity will be very high it will be it will be uh, mass produced uh the next application nowadays is warehousing industry for example you produce a, a let me give a simple example uh, all of you must have heard the name of hero motors previously hero honda and they manufacture motorcycles at the rate of 16 seconds per motorcycle per plant and there eight such plants it is the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world by numbers uh, just so that you know so what happens in hero motors for example i mean uh, normal warehousing you must you must know for example right from um, the agricultural product to um, textile products and so on and so forth it's very easy to uh, visualize how the warehousing can work but for hero motors for example the challenge was they make so many motorcycles per day and the distribution the demand is of different types the supply is of different types and therefore they have to store motorcycles and it's impossible to store those many motorcycles on 
plain ground and you have to go vertical so they have a warehouse which is 100 feet tall and they have motorcycles coming in on pallets as the motorcycles are produced and the motorcycles are to be kept stored uh, when the production rate is there and whenever there is a demand they have to be delivered to the supply chain so what it is known as is it is known as automated storage and retrieval systems and motorcycles even for motorcycles this is this is done and then of course there is industries like forging the robotics is is a key player because a it's a mass production industry b it's hazardous conditions and therefore loading unloading of hot um, iron metal into forging presses and also inspection is a very very big application for robotics all the finished product is inspected using various various applications various technologies like vision or ultrasound testing or dye penetration testing and so on where robotics is used and now robotics has gone into more high tech areas and the reason for that is de skilling of humans for example medical robotics where uh, the dr jakka will speak more about that the problem with medicine is that surgeons are required to be highly skilled and any mistake by the surgeon can be fatal to the patient and therefore in surgical in surgery these days people are deploying robots and the biggest manufacturer is known as intuitive uh, robotics and they make uh, an arm known as da vinci and uh, that medical robotics is used where even a lower skilled surgeon can perform higher skilled surgeries so basically uh, de skilling does not mean reduction of skill of humans but de skilling means uh, reduction of complexity required for the application of surgery and so on and so forth and then there are a few applications for under water robotics no humans can for example travel 7 kilometers below the uh, below the water nobody can travel 150 meters also as a matter of fact and therefore if you have to do deep sea exploration and so on and so forth uh, robotics has uh, robotics is used uh, professor whenever my time is done please let me know because you have limited time and i don't want to you know take too much time so i'll just list down uh, certain applications as i said in the previous part of my presentation assembly automation machining automation welding automation computer vision now there is a new technology known as cobots because robots are very dangerous robots are very strong and therefore humans cannot really work near robots or they didn't they were not allowed to work near robots and every robot would have a complete steel fence and inside which humans are not allowed to go when the robots are operating but now new technologies have come up which are known as uh, cobots cobots are basically co-working with humans and these robots are safe so that humans and robots need not have a partition in between them and cobots therefore are now becoming very very popular for inspection and small pick and place applications they do not have capacities of 200 and 300 kilos for pick and place but uh, they have small capacities but at the same time they can work safely with humans um uh, in the in the end applications you have simple things like pick and place and palletizing uh, you can have uh, you know applications in electric cars are now getting into a big way in the world so robotics is very much used in electric vehicle manufacturing for battery manufacturing battery is very dangerous by the way um the burning temperature of a lithium ion cell is 2300 degrees celsius so humans are not really supposed to go very close to the batteries and work very close to the batteries so battery assembly second problem is that if the battery heats then the car can catch fire and therefore there is a huge technology for actually making sure that thermal interface material and thermal insulation material is applied properly to uh, the panels where the batteries are placed and there cannot be any error and therefore typically this is done by robotics and not by humans now there are multiple technologies that are required to actually implement robotics all of us in colleges learn about six axis robots uh, i don't know if you are aware of why six axis becomes very uh, uh, significant i'll tell you the answer mathematically and by the way let me tell you of robotics the language of robotics is mathematics you have to know what six axis robot because six axis robots will guarantee any position and any orientation uh that in the space that is required and that is why six axis robots are the most common robots and also it has it comes with something known as non redundant non redundant solution that means to achieve one position and one orientation there are only eight possible solutions mathematically for that robot then there are other robots like gantry robots which are x y z kind of uh, robots where the kinematics is decoupled
there are automatically guys with vehicle because what happens is you put big cutters on the shop floor and that thematical technology that have come up by different technologies like magnetic tape guidance that do that and autonomous vehicle engineering controls engineering CLCs, CSCs and other control elements pneumatics and hydraulics computer vision mathematics programming welding aging and all these technologies are required to actually implement a robotic solution to achieve an objective i'll end my address saying that robotics is a very charming area and everybody thinks that robotics should be deployed wherever humans can be replaced for safety or other reasons like for example in this case of pandemic everybody is now scared of the other individual as you are from fulton so you know that even pune satara boundary was is not really a sustainable model for making robotics any robotic deployment has to make economic and finance will not work for example if a worker in india costs 15000 rupees and to replace that a worker you need a 60 lakh rupees robot uh, you know it is not possible that robots will be deployed in those areas also one has to understand that robots cannot do 100% of the tasks that humans do today for example robots cannot do thinking and uh, uh, just hold on my battery has become low hold on let me tell you Sorry about that. So, uh, as I was saying, it has to make economic sense. And previously, robots were only doing mechan, uh, you know, what they called as mechanization, which was replacing of human muscles. But now, with more and more sensory and mathematical technologies and algorithms and machine learning and so on and so forth, they are moving towards replacing of human, uh, human sensory perception and, to a certain extent, decision making parameters. So within the 15 minutes, I just wanted to touch upon all these uh, topics of what uh, this uh, robotics is. In Marathi, they call it Gaul Bangal. So there are, of course, innumerable applications of robotics. Robotics is going to go very aggressively in future. And wherever it's possible, robots are going to be deployed. So it's a very, very good career move to actually learn robotics and move aggressively towards robotics. Thank you, sir. Sir, your phone is on mute. Your voice is on mute. Yes, sir, your, your computer is on mute. So we have another time for question and answer. So now I request uh, Dr. Zamkar, the former uh, Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra Hills University. He has a lot of contribution in medical field as well as I have seen a lot of engineering things and you know a lot of curricular development and his experience we want to listen from him. Is my screen seen there? Yes, uh, I can see you, but uh, you can share the slides. I'm doing. Yeah, now you are presenting. Can I see? Okay. Yes. 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 But I am saying. Not, to, but I am not. Uh, yeah, I am seeing the first page of our file. ISA, International Society yeah. of Policy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me profusely thank Ajay for yes. inviting me to talk on this very interesting topic. And believe me, I am first time talking with a whole mass of engineers. And that too, uh, who are expert sure. and uh, I have a passion for robotics from the beginning. So I thought uh, uh, something. Now I'm a surgeon by training, and I was vice chancellor of the medical university. And afterwards, I uh, persistent system as a consultant in healthcare. 
but I have passion for uh, technology. Uh, if you go to my website, arunjamka.com, where it says the technology for better healthcare, where we say technology is going to be an enabler to drive the effort of healthcare. Now, uh, with a sensitization by Mangesh about various sectors, I think uh, robots are coming in big way. And as we look at the market manufacturing, then it is obviously there. I was in the US and now I think uh, iRobo, that's a Roomba, which is vacuum cleaning, is available a bit cheap. Now, uh, 2013, uh, we had uh, uh, a national consultation on promoting research in because uh, the even to computing technologies was over. And uh, as a vice chancellor, uh, we had a meeting of uh, uh, at the industry, universities, and then uh, we had this rich discussion. And surprisingly, uh, Mangesh was there. And Mangesh stays uh, in my own Rohan Tapovan, and we didn't know. And this was the first time that this industry uh, academia correlation was there. And then we did some positive steps for uh, developing an Indian robot. Robots have come uh, uh, recently in past because of the safety nature that uh, why don't you use some robots for a corona epidemic because of the safety. And I think uh, there are various uh, robots available, but they are not uh, obviously in India. But then uh, it could be available in subsequent use because they can walk, they can go, and then the, the doctor can say watch, doctor can monitor remotely. So uh, we have seen that almost 16 countries, they're using for public safety, quarantine enforcement, disinfecting. So various components of uh, healthcare administration uh, as regards the the corona or COVID infection in pandemic is concerned is used. So uh, apart from that, the robots are used in hotels. They are used in taking care of elderly because in, say in Western societies, they have less population and the society is getting aged and they are, uh, say they are relying on say uh, robots. But then the best thing that can do we can have this for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. When the patient has been shot, we require to say give the. So this video will show you how a robot can be used for giving. It is manufactured with the striker. Now this is a normal CPR. I think everybody should know how to do a cardiopulmonary resuscitation. for uh, CPR are flown to, say, drones at a site. And when, uh, usually in Western societies, everybody is trained. But then I think there are some simple instructions. Now, I work on a project called iDoctor, where we are creating a drug dispensing ATM, which dispenses on the symptom-based algorithm. But now, similar basis, we could create a robot of an iDoctor, where uh, the doctor can talk with the patient and the delivery of the drug could be done through a robot. Now, uh, there is a, there are tremendous uh, called as fascination about robots as well as the as well as of artificial intelligence system. So this is a movie by Steven Spielberg in 2001, where uh, he's talking of a robotic boy. And then how he can 
So he is just like humanoid, but then he can't have emotions. In recent past, uh, some of the Western democracies, they have thought of giving uh, partial citizenship to robots. Now, uh, Mangesh Lone retails, I'm going to just restrict myself to healthcare. So we have surgical robots, we have rehabilitation robots, then we have non-invasive radio surgery robots because they replace where when there is radiation, you can have robots there and pharmacy robots. But I'm going to restrict myself only to healthcare robots. And uh, because these are the, uh, con say, congregation of engineers, and that's why these are the company profiles. Now, the leader is obviously Intuitive, who manufactured D-Vancy robots. Then there's Bluebell, Tink, Hansen, Mako, Renshaw, Mazur. And in recent part, there is uh, what's called Meditronics. These are the various companies which are coming. Now, the, uh, the small operations could be done by a robot called, a, say, this is a envelope, it's a scrub nurse. Now, why, why I'm trying to tell this is instead uh, for India to, say, pay attention to big robots, we can just start doing small things. Now, let us say, now, this is a, uh, say, robotic scrub nurse where it's an AI system, it's programmed to find out what are the further steps of the operation and which equipments are required. And then you uh, extend the hand by gesture, the, uh, the, the scrub nurse, which is robots, gives you instrument. Now, my, my consideration was, uh, we can think of doing some small things. Now, the patient is in shock. We can have, uh, say, maybe in remote areas or the rural areas. We could have a remote, say, a robotic arm, which we can, uh, say, give, say, uh, injections or uh, maybe IV fluids because people die because of loss of fluid. And therefore, what is required is no high-grade technology. Uh, you require some ultrasonic sensor to identify a vein, and you require a small movement where uh, the, the, the cannula can be inserted. I think we need to think of uh, these, uh, these robots. Now, these, are, these have a lot of uh, applications. Now, even in hospitals, uh, while we try to give an IV uh, to a baby, it is impossible, sometimes impossible to just uh, get the vein. So we can have ultrasound probe to identify the venous site, and then uh, it can help the pediatrician. Sometimes in myocardial infarct, when the patient is in shock, and we want to do a cardiac catheterization, it's done to a vein in the thigh called a femoral vein, and it is collapsed. So these robotic arms could help you to just cannulate the vein. Now, uh, the basically, the whole uh, challenge was accepted. Now, robots, uh, le let us uh, start from beginning. Uh, robots are uh, maybe humanoid, but they're the machine. That is not a machine, but it's an information system with arms, that's all. And then the whole uh, attention of world was uh, driven to a transatlantic robotic surgery. Now, once you have a robot, and then robotic surgery is done by sitting uh, next to the theater, the moment there's a distance between two, this distance could be extended. And uh, now the, uh, this cholecystectomy was done by a surgeon sitting in New York, and I think uh, 8,000 miles. So there's no question, because the, the moment the transmission of uh, the information is there, it can be done. So this was done by you know, what's called as a Darwin C surgical system. Now these are the pioneer in the field. So uh, it is a company called Vatikati Urology Institute at Henry Ford. And uh, we should be proud that whole Davansi surgical system is engineered by Dr. Mani Menon, who is an Indian. And therefore, uh, subsequently, uh, all these machines were used for doing uh, various surgeries. Now, uh, I just want to find out, now this is the robotic arm with uh, multiple arms, and then uh, you need to dock, dock in. And these are the various procedures uh, being done. 
now uh, prostatectomy various urological operations you can do cardiac operations gynec operations all these operations can be done so before uh, uh, before giving some robotic information uh, because this is a, these are the what is called as uh, uh, modular arms because the d1c initially had a single arm and it become very heavy now the metatronics and even d1c has come with this uh, modular arm so that it becomes more mobile so let me first explain because all these uh, minimum invasive surgeries are done and uh, i hope um, being engineer you may not be knowing what is a laparoscopic surgery or what is a minimum invasive surgery so in a minimum invasive surgery what we do is we put a needle in the in the abdomen and then uh, inject carbon dioxide and therefore the abdomen inflates and then we put a trocar and through which we put a telescope and then the surgeon can see on the monitor and he see, he's seeing here and then we put multiple uh, trocars through which we put lot of instruments and these instruments are there and therefore uh, you are able to operate looking at the uh, say uh, monitor and because that whole surgery which would have been required a big incision or maybe 6 8 inch is converted into three or four small 10 mm uh, one hole and uh, three or four 5 mm holes as an it result there is a there is a dramatic recovery because surgery uh, the morbidity of surgery is on dissection inside the body and therefore there is less dissection so wherever you know, uh, actually you can classify the surgery has surgery proper and access for the surgery so therefore suppose uh, you want to do uh, say appendectomy going to appendix is an access whereas surgery proper is just a small thing just going down there and just removing appendix in ligating two vessels so it's a very small so everywhere uh, this laparoscopic surgery or minimum invasive surgery is indicated so this is how uh, is a modular thing and now the what are the basic advantage of a robotic surgery is first thing uh, is 3d second thing you are sitting uh, in a in a console away from the operation theater and then uh, like you are playing a computer game uh, you are operating the equipments which are introduced inside so what happens is now this is vision there are multiple uh, say, mod- say modular arms which are introduced inside and then you are looking at the uh, 3d vision you require a 3d goggles so that there is a depth there so this is the basic advantage that while you are doing the laparoscopy surgery you have two vision whereas the 3d vision is you are seeing the depth and therefore what happens is then you are able to do everything you have to dock inside and then just operate so as a net result there is a least uh, dissection uh, you go fast there and the morbidity is less obviously it's costly i'm just trying to show you one of the operation done by one of my uh, colleague dr himesh gandhi uh, who is a chief robotic surgeon in in uh, ruby hall i just downloaded from youtube so you can see uh, he now he just sitting outside and uh, this is a prostatectomy being done so here there are multiple arms now the basic advantage of a robo is uh, it has 360 degree movement the movement of hand is amplified as in it is you can see the the, the sutures he is taking is so fast is faster than uh, actual sutures and uh, therefore this is very possible in addition uh, all these arms are available with uh, energy sources now this is a uh, a harmonic scalpel where is uh, cutting the prostate and there is a catheter and therefore uh, the advantage is he is not there inside the theater he is not even washed he is outside his uh, his uh, whole console is connected uh, to the arm and he is operating from outside but then he operates like normal now uh, we have travel from uh, what is called as uh, multiple ports to what is called a single port in a single port instead of having a 110 mm port and 3 and 4 5 mm port is a one single port and now intuitive surgical the d1c they have come with uh, the system where there are multiple uh, single ports with a multiple arms which is going inside now i just want to introduce that even the laparoscopic surgery is one because there is a various surgeries where uh, what is called as a minimum access surgery minimum invasive surgery where uh, same technology is available uh the you can do hysteroscopic surgery where uh, you pass in telescope 
to the cervix and go inside the uterus and remove polyps, remove everything inside. Then you can have uh, ankle surgery, the knee surgery. You can you might be knowing a lot of things about, uh, say, arthroscopy and going inside. And then where various uh, all these are available with a robotic arm. So uh, the spine is one. You can see this is spine where uh, same technology is available. You go straight in, and then so this, this is a, a herniated lumbar disc being removed. And uh, this is a robotic, what you call as a neurosurgery. And this is a gynec surgery. I like to talk about hysteroscopy. And then you can do even cardiac surgery because sometimes uh, the access is more. Let us say it's a PDA, patent arteriosis, where you have to go in and just lag it one vessel. And for that, you have to go through in. So this can be done better with the aerobotic technique. So I just want to show you the availability of what robots can do. And they are very sensitive. They are sensors. And then now this is uh, being done for a hip replacement. And you can see the precision. Because uh, as Mangesh said, you can work in microns. So obviously, a very small part is what that we want to cut. It can to be done. Now this is uh, now we already have uh, what is called the 3D systems available. We have uh, what is called as MRIs and the 3D images are available. And whole thing can be planned before, and then the surgery could be done by going through a planned thing. Obviously, now this is a total hip replacement. Accurately, the amount of the is removed. You can do you now. This is a intuitive robot of DVNC, and then. You can see how now this is a guy sitting on the console and uh, he's operating like a computer game. And then all these movements are translated across within. And then they're so sensitive that perfect perception is there. Now, oh, let me introduce, so various uh, systems, those are available. Now, uh, as I said, the Metatronics is coming in big way. Now, they have come with what is called as a modular uh, robots, where each instrument comes with a separate, uh, say, portable things. It's called a more, say, Metatronic Hugo system. Then we have what is called as a uh, various uh, surgical system where there's a portable and transportable modular designs, and therefore this whole thing can has become more easy. Then we have what's called as a transgenic uh, Sinhan surgical system, where uh, there is a laparoscopic instruments and uh, endoscopic manipulation can be done. And uh, it's very useful for uh, approximation, ligation, and then this system is used for uh, dynamic surgery, colorectal surgery. Then we have, you know, sometimes what happens is uh, um, we require some more accuracy. And uh, you, the surgeon or the operating guy wants to have less radiation. I mean, now the core path is nothing but a robotic system for, uh, say, cardiac catheterization. And the whole system thing can be done by sitting outside. And then we have, uh, we can have, uh, say, accurate uh, localization of uh, coronary arteries going inside. And then what all the thing can be done by sitting outside. So there is no radiation. Otherwise, inside. Uh, you have to take pictures to uh, say x-rays every th maybe three minutes and there is a lot of radiation this whole thing can be avoided then we have this is now we can do all these procedures i'm just going to show you and more and more uh, equipments which are uh, trying to do this is a robotic assisted bronchoscopy now the bronchus uh, is what is called a schwas and relica where uh, you breathe and then uh, after the bronchus goes inside and uh, leads to uh, the lungs. And uh, sometimes what happens, all these uh, branches and rebranches of the lung, say bronchus, they are so small that you can't go and manipulate. And this is, uh, as uh, this is said, physically impossible to go into small bronchioles. Now, uh, the robotics can have a smaller size bronchoscopes, which can go directly inside and maybe uh, can go to an area of a bronchiole which is humanly impossible, and then uh, take biopsy and do everything available. Then we have, you now recently I just said that monotonous 
operations which you get people get bored can be done by robots and we have what's called as a task hair transplant system because you have to transplant one hair by hair one by one and therefore this is a system where uh, you have to just give uh, each and then it can implant hair then we have uh, various orthopedic robotic system so this is called is a macos orthopedic uh, robotic system for uh, partial knee total knee uh, applications now in, uh, if you see a total knee replacement it requires so much precision and uh, you have to exactly remove the shaft of the say head of the pe uh, fe um, tibia uh, down femur and then you have to have that whole thing inside which requires a precision and then we have uh, various orthopedic uh, systems available by stracker uh, which is for the total hip total knee replacement and then nowadays uh, i think uh, uh, even the dental implants are coming in a big way and it requires so precise because the upper implant while you put it requires a, it's just millimeter away from the anus and therefore uh, we have dental robots available then we have uh, say same rosa system for a total knee arthroplasty then we have a pre excelsis which is called as a um, eye surgery because in eye also suppose uh, you want to go inside it has to be very precision making because it's all micro level so your retinal surgery can be done and then uh, all those uh, surgical precisions are required can be done with this robotic system then we have a, again a other company of smith nephew from total knee arthroplasty then as i said we have a heart catheterization robo for cardiac catheterization doing everything in then in cath lab which can be connected with a the robo then we have uh, say robotic uh, what's called a sport system where uh, you know, all those uh, the precise operations can be done then all, then we have something called as uh, fontoscopy so here uh, there is a combination of robo and ai system so it's a fontoscope and uh, it has uh, the robo can go there and then you can look in the dilated pupil and say see inside and then once you go inside uh, this is now being used for screening of diabetic retinopathy and uh, it requires uh, uh, so much of technique now this is the first time that fda has approved the screening of diabetic retinopathy by ai system and then we have all these uh, available image handling so image handling software is there where all these images are put into image processing machine and then uh, a robo going closer to a uh, pupil go hello hello ha uh, i think somebody is asking question uh, what i want to suggest is there is a separate question answer session so in case uh, dr zamkar sir's presentation is over it was very wonderful presentation uh, many people they like that some more people are joining as they listen uh, but we want to listen from tushar agrawal now tushar are you ready with your presentation uh, before that i just want to confirm whether jamkar sir has uh, completed the presentation or yet some more things are there uh, under 3 uh, minutes okay okay no problem are you seeing my video yes yes now i am able to see you on the screen your video is not video is not slides are not seen video is not seen uh, you are seen in the video but your slides are not seen okay yeah now the, now the video is running sir maze are right now you can share that
earlier all videos were seen na yes, yes 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 all the videos all the slides we could see but now uh, again i think we we'll have to present okay yeah so video, sir, the video is running now nicely okay anyway uh, yeah uh, just to come to conclusion now this is a uh, robotic thing available for training and uh, lastly i just wanted to show you that all the could be done for music now this is a gesture based music yes thank you thank you sir thank you sir for very exciting presentation it was uh, very uh, interesting and important to our panel discussion today uh, i i request tushar uh, tushar agrawal to come up with his presentation hello hello i request uh, sahil uh, salve to mute his video because you are uh, again and again seen here No, no. You just mute, mute your video. You are seeing here. Yes, sir. Uh, I request Tushar Agarwal. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, we are not. Hello, sir. Hello, Salve. Please, please mute your video and audio. You are presenting. You just stop that. Otherwise, sir, I am questioning which language is used for the robotic. No, no. You please don't Hello, ask sir. question right now. There is a question answer session at the end. So please mute your mic and uh, video because our time is very important. At the end, you will find that. i request all the audience uh, who are there as student members and faculty members to take care that suddenly you don't ask anything uh, we have enough time at the end i request tushar agrawal to come with his presentation Okay, maybe uh, Tushar uh, needs some more time. So, Papar sir, uh, can we have one session because he needs to again log out and come back again. Uh, I request Papar sir, uh, can we use this time? Yeah, Tushar. Yeah, I I hope uh, Tushar is able to join. Hello, uh, Tushar. We are not able to listen to you. Can you just say hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Now, now you are audible. Just switch on your video and share the slides. Anything what you feel. Okay, I'll present now. Um, Okay, so I hope uh, you can see the uh, presentation. Yeah, it is coming up. 
Ya, oke. Okay. Yeah, now we are in you. Yeah, that's it, sir. Yeah. Will you right? Okay, so can you see the video? Yeah, video. Okay, can you make it full screen then? Sure. So Tushar is written from London. He has very interesting applications of robots in pharmacy and in supermarkets and in general. Yeah, I request the sir to show the slides full screen. Yeah, it's full screen, isn't it? Yeah, now we are seeing your video, not your slides actually. Yeah, my video what is in full slide, screen, isn't it? Slideshow mode. Ah, you go to slideshow mode. F I. F I. Yeah, is it full screen now? Yeah, you can. Can you hear me while the video is playing? Yeah, please make it in slide. Yeah, we are able to. Okay, so this was uh, the video I wanted to show about a system which I had worked on for the last two years. And mm, as uh, Mr. Mangesh Kale mentioned that typically a person getting 15,000 rupees, it's not worthwhile replacing them with a 60 lakh robot. Uh, but then if you come to the Western world where uh, people have to be paid a minimum wage, which is in UK, uh, eight pounds per hour. Uh, so for a typical worker in a factory doing uh, grocery order picking, uh, the humanly wage which you would pay them for one year, you can easily buy a robot to do the same job. So uh, while it's not feasible in the uh, India uh, and developing countries as of now, these robots for uh, these type of jobs are very well much appreciated and they make cost effective uh, solutions for um, the Western world. Uh, the similar cellin is now being used by Kroger, which is a um, US based supermarket chain, the biggest supermarket chain in the US. Uh, so coming back to um, this online grocery orders. So uh, grocery, people are now having busy lives. People want to order grocery online because no one wants to take time to go to DMART or uh, the likes and you know waste half an hour to buy your weekly shopping. So typically, I, I think even in Pune, there's Groffers, there's Big Basket where you can you know just go online, place your order and get your food delivered. And this is a solution which would you know really make it possible. In fact, the automation for this system is to a very great extent, like you go download the app, you place the order. The order goes to the warehouse central system and depending on the time orders, uh, like go to X, there's, there's a big X, Y grid. So grids have a cell, cell one, cell two, cell three in X and same for cell one, cell two, cell three in Y, so on. It's a massive grid as you could see in the video at a time, thousand robots are going on in each direction.
and uh, mm, there are storage bins uh, so there are storage bins up to two and a half lakh storage bins so yeah you can imagine different food items can be stored in such a system and uh, E, there's a lot of artificial intelligence in these systems. So, for example, uh, if the system realizes that it's summertime and people are ordering more of strawberries, then uh, it makes sense to keep all the strawberries uh, closer to the robots, uh, as in closer to the picking station rather than further away in the system. So th that AI-based decisions are made when you load the warehouse, where exactly what food item goes. And... Uh, of course, these robots are not uh, fault-proof. They do develop faults. So whenever there's a fault, uh, a particular region on the grid has to be blocked out. And for that reason, uh, you need to make sure that the same food item is stored at multiple places so that if uh, one region is blocked out because of a faulty robot, the same food item can be picked from another location. And as we saw in the video, um, a typical uh, grocery order, which is typically uh, 20 items, let's say bananas, milk, um, cucumbers, some fruits, some beer. Uh, there are typically 20 items in particular human, uh, in a particular user's order. And uh, the robot takes uh, five minutes to pick the whole order. Whereas if uh, this job was to be done by a human being, they would take at least a 30 to 35 minutes, and then they would have breaks in between. So it makes much more time efficient a solution to have robots. And in this particular application, the robots have been able to pick 10,000 orders per day. And as you can imagine in this COVID situation that we are in, um, the, the workers can't go to the warehouse to work and it makes it difficult for pe people to get food delivered but if you have robots working in the warehouse you're not relying on human beings coming into the warehouse to prepare your grocery order in times that we are living in um, Again, in terms of uh, speed, so what's moving meter per second, that's in terms of kilometer per hour, that's 14.4 kilometer per hour, that's very high speed. Uh, so it requires millimeter level of uh, accuracy in the movement because two robots, the clearance between them is five millimeters. So if a given robot overshoots by two or three millimeters, they would collide. And each of these robots are 20,000 pounds, which is 20 lakh rupees. And that's a significant loss for the company if there's a collision. So there's a lot of control, uh, PID control, engineering, uh, precision required here uh, to make the robots move with accuracy. And again, as we know, acceleration, jerk has to be controlled because let's say a robot is carrying some food item, which is glass bottles, a bottle of champagne, and you know, they move very fast and stop suddenly. The jerk would mean that the bottle can get smashed. So you have to control a lot of parameters on these robots so that there's no damage uh, and hence uh, they provide the efficiency which is expected of them. Again, these robots go down deep um, into the hive. Uh, so there's stacks of baskets. There are 21 baskets and they go down up to uh, 9 to 10 meters deep. And this was uh, again something Mr. Mangesh Kali had mentioned about the uh, motorcycle factory where they have to stack vertically. So similar uh, uh, solutions have to be used in a warehouse where we stack vertically and go 10 meters down. There are 21 baskets stacked in a line um, uh, and hence we get the space efficiency. Uh, again, um, because these are robots working in the warehouse, the video which we saw, uh, there was the whole warehouse was well lit. But uh, at, when a typical warehouse is in operation, you can keep the light shut off because you don't need the light. And hence, there's uh, while the robots are using electricity to run, uh, but there's power savings because you don't need light uh, in the warehouse. Whereas if humans were to go and pick uh, the food, then you wouldn't the warehouse to be properly lit. So there's a, a good trade-off there. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, in terms of stack, we mentioned that you know there's a 21 basket stack. Uh, there's a flat flexible cable which goes down, picks the basket, brings the basket up, takes it to where it needs to be done. Um, robots tell the battery levels to the central control system. So should the battery level go below 10%, the central control system will instruct the robot to go on the charger. So robot will go automatically on the charger, charge itself. When the charge level is above 90%, the central control system will ask the bot to come out and 
start doing the job again and uh, like i said uh, it has to do so many million of computations because it has to send one robot in one direction and the other in the other direction um, and if a particular bot develops a fault it has to reroute the uh, movement of all the robots around it because it doesn't want uh, the system doesn't want to collide with the faulty bot in the middle of the grid so it has to reroute all the bots around it uh, so it's a very complex system very very interesting system and lots of improvement is possible possible here uh, as as other speakers have mentioned this is just the beginning and uh, 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 the op system more and more efficient in years to come uh, uh, so similarly um, i thought um, uh, i could talk about an application for pharmacy bapat uh, sir about the pharmacy industry that uh, in uh, in the western world you can't get a prescription you take the prescription go to the pharmacy and buy your medicine but now the trend is changing so if you go to see the doctor the doctor can automatically uh, forward the prescription to the pharmacy of your choice so imagine the level of automation that's possible you go to uh, the doctor the doctor sends your prescription to the pharmacy and the rob robots in the pharmacy go ahead pick up all your prescription like a paracetamol a cough syrup whatever you need and by the time you reach the pharmacy your order is already collected you just pay and go away so this is uh, another level of uh, automation that's possible in the pharmacy industry and i would like to show a short video uh, which would give you a feel of how the automation is possible in the pharmacy industry so i'll go ahead and play the video uh, if you allow me to Can you see in my video now? No. Hello. Can you see the video? No. No. Okay. Maybe I'll stop and start again. You can share. You can share the screen actually. You can run the video and then yeah, share the screen. now you can see yeah yeah yes it's coming now. application in the pharmacy industry so you can see different medicines are been picked by the robots Video is not seen. Video is not seen. Yeah. Sorry. Video. I think you have selected your RAM PowerPoint screen. If you select your video where you are presenting that PowerPoint screen, then we can see. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'll start again then. Hmm. Just a sec. Can you see now? No, it is. It is just coming and going again. Huh. Now? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Now it's seen. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the problem. as you can see robots come pick the medicines from the the pharmacy warehouse as you can see this is automatically scanned
So, uh, so we can see there's a lot of um, robotics, uh, control engineering, PLC involved in these end-to-end uh, -end solutions. So there's a lot of opportunities um, in this area. And um, one of the questions that typically comes in, will robots uh, end up replacing human beings? And I would just like to touch upon that. I worked with Okado Technology, and what I have seen is that uh, while robots are taking over the jobs of human beings, there are much higher skilled or rather the person who would be doing the job of picking the groceries. Now he can move up and you know do some sort of you know low level technician job and um, build his skills so it's not like you know he, the jobs are gone there are more jobs created at a better pay scale for these people if they are willing to learn so there's opportunities there's lots to be done and uh, opportunities for everyone uh, and it's an exciting field to be uh, playing around in uh, that's it i would like to uh, end my presentation because i'm conscious about time Yes, thank you. Mr. It was a really great uh, presentation and uh, it was something innovative and very new application. Uh, typically in the developing countries, it has to come at. We will address this during our panel discussion. Really, thank yeah. you. So I will uh, request if Buffett sir is there, uh, he can just acknowledge the presence of ISA senior people. Otherwise, uh, I will do that. We have uh, Mr. Ramani Ayer, who is a DVP and he has contributed. He's a senior a fatherly figure in ISA International Society of Automation. Uh, Ayer, sir, just uh, I, I, I just request you to say maybe you can show the hand and people will come to know. You can switch on the video for a while. <laughs> He was with Pope Marshall for several years and worked for CIA and ISA. I request IRSA to unmute the mic and show his hand uh, so that people will come to know that you are with us. Otherwise, I'll go to Mr. Dilip Miskin, who is also present among us. Miskin, sir, uh, is from UL Group and he, he was also the past secretary of ISA police section and now very active member of ISA police section. Ms. Kinsel, uh, just say hello uh, so that... Yeah, hello. can you hear me? Uh, yeah, just uh, unmute the, uh, your video also. Yeah, I think I unmuted my mic now. Is that yeah, fine? Video. Yeah, yeah, good evening, everybody. I think it's a pleasure uh, to you know connect to you people on the uh, robotics group, a new group. I think uh, Deshmukh sir, uh, I had some problems in connection, but I think later on I got yeah. connected with the help of your people. I think it's been a good uh, beginning for this group and uh, we look forward for many more uh, such uh, interactions with uh, the team and uh, wishing you all the best uh, for the future. Thank you. Yeah, we have Mr. Vilas Chitnis. He's also a very senior ISA uh, from Mumbai. So he is, uh, uh, he's really, uh, very good in terms of connecting to industry and a lot of projects he has done. So, Chitnis sir, are you here? Can you just show the... Maybe you can just say hi to people. Actually, Bapad sir, uh, somehow he got disconnected and I'm doing his job also to acknowledge the presence of senior people from ISA. If he's not there, I, I just acknowledge the presence of Dr. Abhijit Pawar. In fact, Dr. Abhijit Pawar is a radiologist and he got a nucleus diagnostic clinic in Pune and a lot of research he has also done along with us, many joint presentations we did and work with Dr. Jamkarsal also. Ameya is with us, Ameya Umrani. Can you just say hello to people? So now there are some more people joined. Uh, so Amir Ubrain is from Netherlands and he is from, he did his master's from uh, University of 20 and uh, maybe even Tushar, I, uh, he's also one of the friends like you and we work for several other things. 
so he uh, he is from netherland and he works with a company but the department from which he has done uh, its name is uh, mechatronics and robotics so that's why he is with us hello i mean can you just yeah just uh, show your video as well as uh, just say hi, hi to people yes uh, can you see me now actually i turned on the the microphone and the video no video is not seen no. Uh, because I can see my video here. Okay, but I think <laughs> I think uh, Kushar, so I am seeing Kushar's video. Hello. Hello. Maybe some people could maybe must be able to see. Yeah, people are saying you are you are seen in your video. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So uh, hello. He is also going to share something during panel discussions. Can I start? Yeah. There are many other people also from uh, ISA. Uh, typically, Sandeep. Uh, well, do you want? Mr. Uh, no, I just Raji. want you to show hand and your I acknowledge your present and your presence and your session is there after this. Uh, so please be ready with that. I also acknowledge the presence of uh, Rohit Kadam and uh, of course Anand Ayer and many others. If I have, I have covered almost everyone. There are some faculty members from uh, all over country here and some are from. This Fulton area also. So I, I would request uh, Sandeep Raju to come up with his presentation. We have now three more presentations, short presentations. I request Sandeep Raju to come up with his slides or maybe verbal presentation, and then Mr. Rohit Kadam, and then Dr. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you so much for being yeah. the convener. Yeah. for this online panel discussion on robotics and applications. And thank also, you. I at the same time thank everyone who have joined this online panel discussion and are trying to make this program a success, especially the keynote presentations coming from Dr. Arun Chamkar, Mr. Magnesh Kale, and Mr. Tushar Agarwal. So we heard a lot about robotics and the applications, so I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time in describing about robotics or giving uh, information, but I'll just try to keep uh, the information as short as possible. But before that, I would like to a little bit discuss about ISA, what ISA does, what ISA Automatic Controls and Robotics Division is currently doing. Uh, so that way, who are not members of ISA will know about it. And at the same time, I hope they join us. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, yeah, now you're presenting, yes. All right. Yes, slides are seen, yeah. So a little bit about the goals of ISA. ISA is abided by all these policies. One is to advance the arts and sciences related to the theory, design, manufacture, and use of instruments and controls. Second is to encourage research. Third is to foster education. Fourthly, it's to advance the standards of science and engineering. And fifthly, it's to promote intercourse among its members and with allied technological societies. Vision, mission, and values of ISA. When it comes to vision, ISA's vision is always to create a better world through automation. When it comes to mission, it's to advance technical competence by connecting the automation community to achieve operational excellence. When it comes to values, excellence is one of those uh, which we strive to provide industry-leading resources and unbiased content developed and vetted by our community of experts, whoever are uh, participating in terms of sections or divisions. And secondly, it's the integrity. So we act with honesty, integrity, and trust, treating others with respect in all that we do. 
Thirdly, it's about diversity and inclusion. We strive to be a global, diverse, and welcoming organization. Fourthly, it's about collaboration, which we seek out opportunities to work together for the benefit of society, its members, and our profession. And fifthly, it's about professionalism. We uphold the highest standards of competence and skill in everything we do. What are our ISA and ISA Automatic Control and Robotics Division strategic objectives? Firstly, it's about the industry reach and awareness. So we are trying to establish and advance ISA's relevance and credibility as the home of automation by anticipating industry needs, collaborating with the stakeholders and developing and delivering pertinent technical content related to that particular area, whether it's automatic controls or robotics or it's process measurement and controls or it's uh, something related to test and measurement. So when it comes to member development and engagement, um, we are trying to enhance the membership value and um, expand the engagement opportunities to nurture and grow a more diverse and global community to advance the automation profession. For instance, uh, we are right now conducting a lot of webinars. At the same time, we are looking many subject matter experts in robotics domain, not just robotics, but advanced controls domain to come up and help us uh, by participating through webinars or contributing articles through newsletters. Uh, and if you are coming up with some kind of panel discussions, we are more than welcome to help you with that. And ISA can definitely uh, help you with it. When it comes to technical education and certification, we are in the process of doing some technical education certification related to robotics, which is coming up. The program is under uh, construction at this point but there are already some other technical educations that are available. And when it comes to certifications, I am pretty sure most of those who are from ISA are aware of certifications like CAP, CCSTs, which are definitely worth exploring and getting certified. Uh, fourthly, it's about leadership and business skill development. So it's always about creating opportunities for members to improve the creative leadership skills to build a network of industry uh, and also the next generation of automation professionals. So it's it's basically what we are trying to do is we're trying to create some kind of a network. Uh, so that way we are in touch with each other and share the latest trends. So uh, this is a little bit ab uh, about the brief, about a brief history about ISA and what ISA ECAD does. So moving forward, let me uh, discuss a little bit about what robotics does. And when it comes to industrial robotics, industrial robotics are considered as a cornerstone of uh, competitive manufacturing, which uh, aims to combine high productivity, quality, and adaptability at minimal cost. So coming to the brief history about how the industrial robotics came, the invention of industrial robotics dates back to 1954 when George Devil filed a patent on a programmed article transfer after teaming up with Joseph Engelberger, the first robotic company, Unimation was founded and put the first robot into service at a General Motors plant in 1961 for extracting parts from a die casting machine. Most of the hydraulic actuated Unimates were sold through the following years for workpiece handling and for spot welding of car bodies. Both these applications were successful, which means that the robots worked reliably and ensured uniform quality. Soon, many other companies started to develop and manufacture industrial robots. An innovation-driven industry was born then. However, it took many years until this industry became profitable. So uh, the, another uh, point that was brought up uh, in the uh, in the presentations was about the six DOF, six degree of freedom, all electric manipulator. So uh, I would just want to give a brief history about that too. So when it comes to the breakthrough, Stanford Arm was designed as a research prototype in 1969 by Victor. At that time, a mechanical engineering student working in Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory created this six degree of freedom which is an all electric manipulator, which was controlled by a standard computer, a digital equipment called PDP-6. So in 1973, the company uh, ASEA, which is now called ABB, 
introduced the first microcomputer controlled all electric industrial robot, that is IRB6, which allowed continuous path motion, a precondition for arc welding or machining. The design later kept on improving to very robust uh, and, robo uh, and the robotic lifetimes of more than 20 years uh, has been reported. In the 1970s, intense diffusion of robots into car manufacturing set in mostly for spot welding and handling applications. And in 1978, the selective compliance assembly robot arm, which is called SCARA SCARA, was invented by a company called Hiroshi Makino of Yamanashi University, Japan. The groundbreaking four axis, low cost design was perfectly suited for small parts assembly as the kinetic configuration allows fast and compliant arm motions. So eventually now we are in the era of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is driving a lot of transformation and innovation in manufacturing. So when it comes to 1990s, we used to use Excel for data analysis, but as we soon are developing with a lot of technological evolutions in 2000s, we came into business intelligence. And when we moved to 2018 and beyond, now we can see there are a lot of softwares available for data analytics. AI in manufacturing, how it's impacting we can say definitely there is a huge impact. When it comes to revenue growth, uh, manufacturers are anticipating a 39% increase in revenue by 2021 through the applications of AI and robotics. When it comes to the positive impacts, 62% of the business leaders and 77% of the workers believe that artificial intelligence will either help do their current jobs better or reduce the repetitive tasks. When it comes to the new job opportunities, yeah, 80% are planning on retraining or redeploying employees, which AI is displacing. And it's not the first time this is happening. We have been there before. The Industrial Revolution of 1700s made, like uh, the, the hand production methods have been replaced by machines and factory systems were born. So this transformation only grew production and the manufacturers were free. And uh, so I would say definitely there is a lot of impact of having AI and there are several layers in artificial intelligence. And I would definitely say enabling intelligence enterprise using machine learning and supporting technologies is definitely beneficial. And I, I'm pretty sure there are uh, already some technologies that are available in the market, such as augmented reality or virtual agents, uh, or you can say the biometrics or facial gesture recognitions, which are being used in several applications for safety procedures. And also, uh, there are different AI capabilities that are being improved upon, such as uh, computer visions, knowledge representations, audio and signal processing, natural language understandings, so on and so forth. So I would definitely uh, agree on that, that a robotics ethics is needed because Otherwise, there is a lot of impact going to happen. So many robots, as well as other uh, authoritative scholars of the history of science and technology have already labeled that 21st century is the age of robots. Actually, in the course of the century, intelligent autonomous machines will gradually substitute many automatic machines. Humanity has built to increase its power by eliminating manual labor and needless drudgery. This factor has become one of the keys to successful economic progress, especially since the Industrial Revolution, as I mentioned, and the emergence of mechanized economy. But there are several points that we still need to consider uh, from when it comes to robo-ethics. One is how far can we go in embodying these ethics in a robot? What kind of ethics is robotic ethics? How contractory is on one side the need to implement in robots and ethics, and on the other, the development of robots autonomy? Is it right? And uh, also, the fourth point is: Is it right to talk about the consciousness, emotions, and the personality of robots? So, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation, and I would like to hand over to Dr. Ajay Deshmukh. Yes, thank you, Sandeep. Very exciting presentation, and. Uh, 
uh, I hope uh, uh, you mentioned about ISA and ATAR. But let me tell you, tell everyone that uh, Sandeep Raju is uh, the director of uh, this ISA ATAR division USA, and uh, we are working in the same core team. We have another speaker from the core team of ISA. Uh, Mr. Rohit, if, in case he is ready, uh, I request him to present and then Mr. Anand subsequently. Hello everybody, this is uh, Rohit Kadam here. Let me go ahead yes. and share my screen. Yes, please share this. Okay, I hope uh, everybody can see my screen now. Yeah, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Ajay on uh, giving me this opportunity to talk here in front of uh, the house. And um, let me just go directly into uh, introducing myself and what I'm going to talk about today. So again, this is Rohit Kadam. Uh, I currently work with Mitsubishi Power. I'm a member of ISA card and also IEEE PES. I've been working in the substation uh, transmission grid area as well as um, uh, the green energy space. So started working right back in uh, 2009. Uh, started with the green energy space and then moved to solar and now I'm working in the battery energy uh, space. So my thoughts are going to revolve more around how robotics can assist folks who are working in this uh, areas. A few quotes I'd like to share um, from Eversource and National Grid and some of the other um, transmission grid owners that we work with here in the US. Uh, drones are definitely an emerging Drones are definitely an emerging uh, area, and uh, the use has been extended into uh, transmission and substations as well as into the green energy space. All right, so let me get uh, dive directly into the industry standards that revolve around drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. The ISO 21384 uh, part three is uh, specifically talks about the different operational procedures for drones and unmanned uh, or unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, this is more of an international standard and um, you can think about it as more a baseline for other countries to come up with their own. The other one I wanted to highlight in the US uh, especially is the, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, not so much of a standard, but more of a regulatory body. Um, so if you want to become a drone pilot, for example, you can get a license from FAA. Uh, there is a whole uh, process that you need to follow, and there are definitely some uh, tests and uh, exams you need to uh, apply for to in order to get your license. And I think you need to train with somebody who already holds the license um, and, and kind of work with them for a few years before you can get your own. So that's an interesting point. And I believe uh, other countries would probably uh, see something similar happening. The NFPA 2400 is the next standard, uh, again, standard for small unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, which are uh, mostly used for safety operations for the public. This is where your uh, Amazon's primate, for example, will fall under. Again, the, you guys are more than welcome to explore the standards. They give you a lot of uh, insight into what are the minimum requirements for safe operation and implementation of the, of the drones. Moving ahead, uh, just wanted to share what, ex what other, uh, from a technological standpoint, what you would have um, as far as the drones are concerned, obviously they'll have uh, something we call as a LIDAR, which helps you in the, in the ranging and mapping of the areas 
very commonly used to uh, look at uh, look at the vegetation management, for example. So if you have certain uh, transmission towers uh, which are not accessible enough or very much in a remote area, then uh, LiDAR is definitely going to help you to create the, the map of the area as well as to identify uh, vegetation and other things which we um, would be much more costly for some for having somebody go out there and uh, and work with that. So uh, the next one was the uh, thermal imaging. This is definitely important um, uh, to have in a drone. So you can actually maneuver the drone and bring it close to the substation or to your uh, transmission tower or to your solar PV uh, modules. And what it actually going to show up is if as we all know, the equipment actually heats up before it breaks down. And this is what we can use the drone to identify these issues in, in advance. The other uh, important thing that a drone can be used for is to detect gas pipeline leaks, mostly these drones that are used for such applications. Uh, there is, they come equipped with a, a methane uh, detection sensor. So obviously it helps you to address uh, um, issues, for example, where you have, where you might have a, a gas pipeline leak. So really gets interesting on how people are using drones for various areas. Uh, my deployment application video wanted to show from, from Intel, but I think we can keep that towards the end of the presentation. And if we have time, we can, we can do that. Let me just dive deep directly into the different drones that are available in the market right now uh, in, in the areas that we that I was uh, referring to. Uh, Intel has a, uh, a platform called the, Fa the Falcon 8 Plus, and uh, it's very much used to, uh, to do your inspections in, in remote areas. So for example, if you're an offshore wind plant, um, uh, the, the Falcon 8 Plus is a very good drone to, um, to use for such applications. Uh, FLR is another big player here in the US. Uh, they have their own RATD Skyradar series, uh, which is again used for uh, on the substation or on the transmission tower, trying to find out problems with your poles. Uh, the the, the Skyradar is a good application. ULC Robotics is another one. And uh, you know they, they have their own uh, VTOL or the V3000 series for the unmanned aerial vehicles um, and they have gone a step further where they kind of integrated the machine learning and asset management to their drone platform. Development platforms I wanted to kind of bring up on was uh, two major players here. So uh, Qualcomm has their RB fly, RB3 platform actually. Uh, the RB, RB5 was just announced last week, uh, but RB5 actually brings in inbuilt 5G and AI kind of integrated into the uh, the SDK as well as the uh, processor. And uh, it is based on their uh, earlier Snapdragon CPU, which was back, uh, launched back in uh, 2017. And uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, they say it's more like a, a bank's vault. So they have different layers of cybersecurity and it's very much in built into the product itself. Uh, it's very fast operation, as you can see, it's 15 tops. Uh, it supports 4G and 5G, and, and the SDK that they have brought about uh, can help you do multiple things like neural processing and machine vision. And, uh, so that is, there's a whole lot you can do with the RB5 uh, rather than the RB3. Uh, NVIDIA is another big player in this market. They have the Jetsons and the DGX platforms, a very, very powerful AI platform. And uh, so they have their own uh, joint ventures and tie-ups with uh, JD as well as Avitas. And yeah, they're all doing work in the uh, transmission as well as substation and, and the uh, green energy space, but obviously it goes much more beyond that. It's not just, uh, we're not just limited to energy here. Another uh, cool example for how robotics can assist uh, people and uh, from a safety standpoint, as you, uh, if, if you guys uh, know, then when we have a switchgear application, breakers are 
easily racked in and racked out, and it presents more of an art flash hazard for operators uh, to work in this area. And there has been a lot of work going on trying to automate this process. Um, the two I, the two key I wanted to highlight was one from USC Robotics, which uh, they are done some work with Con Edison, and what you're seeing in the picture here is actually a uh, tracking robot from them. Uh, it can be fully maneuvered, you know, aligned properly with the breaker, and you can automate that process to rack out, rack out, rack out the breaker. Uh, CBS uh, has a product called the ArcSafe RRS, which uh, does something similar, but you need to first set it up, you need close to the, the actual breaker, and then you can operate the breaker remote, uh, sorry, operate the, the RRS robot remotely, and uh, that way it kind of protects the operator and keeps him beyond the arc flush. Boundary limits. This is another uh, area just wanted to touch base upon augmented reality. I think Sandeep and others have already mentioned this. Uh, as you can see in the cartoon, we, we see a lineman going up to a pole and he has this uh, shield, a face shield that actually shows him some of the, the numbers that relate to the health of the asset. Uh, imagine something similar uh, from the movie Avatar. Where, where they do, um, they actually go up, uh, one step higher, but really this is what we're referring to here is, um, you can just walk into a power plant, for example, with your iPhone or iPad, and if you have the app, uh, you know, understand the, the details on the health of, of the wall, for example, and see, um, uh, you know, uh, much more detailed analysis can happen with that. So that's just a quick overview. Uh, it's something that we are seeing a lot of work being happening, uh, which is happening in this area. Uh, key ones I wanted to highlight was EPRI and Amarin. They kind of tied up together to form an innovation lab uh, to study more detail and do some research in this area. Uh, Cognitive Spark is really an interesting player in this area as well. They, they use Microsoft HoloLens and tie up with the cloud platform from Microsoft, which is Azure, to do some of the analytics behind the scenes. Immersion Scan Web Optics is another good example on what on how far you can go in this area, and I'm sure they'll probably uh, we'll see much more improvement uh, in the next few years. So that's all I had. Uh, so again, I want to found out, uh, thank Dr. Ajay and the team to to, uh, to give us the ability to share our thoughts on this one. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh for your presentation. I request now Anand uh, to uh, just uh, show his presentation in short. Uh, already we have very little time, but then some discussions uh, we need to have at the end. So I request Anand to uh, quickly come up. He has uh, several uh, things uh, like field operator robot. I think this is the theme which uh, he and he had a lot of work with, uh, which he has done. Uh, I'll just uh, start the presentation. Just give me one minute. So yeah, yes, that will save the time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, presentation. So hopefully you are able to see my uh, video, my presentation. Yes, I think so. Just uh, click on to my presentation and you may just pin it. And uh, go a few slides down. So I'm, I'll just skip the initial part, which is about my introduction. And I put this in, my, in the Eckhart LinkedIn site, so you guys can see it later on. So one of the things that I'm very, very excited about right now is what we are calling the PIPER project or PIPER project. A PIPER typically is, it stands for field operator robot. We are trying to create a robot that will do the function that a field operator does in a process plant. I'm working in oil and gas. I have a lot of experience in many process plants. I also have some in the mechanical industry, but most of my experience is in the process plant. And so we emphasize that we should have a robot that is doing the process operator job. And this is probably one of the kind. I mean, we are trying to search the web to find any equivalent robot, and we are still not able to. 
So Eckhart will probably be the first uh, body to create or uh, propose to create such a room. Now, the project has many components as, as we have discussed. Many people have that in the beginning. There, is, there are vision systems. There is going to be motion because there is going to be a humanoid kind of robot, like a bipedal robot. There will be finger movements because you are going to open and close walls. You are going to probably uh, do some gate wall operation or you are going to start and stop, push buttons, pull buttons like that. There will also be logic and control. So there will be commands. So typically when a field operator is working in the field, the plant, the boardroom operator will just call and tell, okay, open this wall, close this wall, do this, take the reading like that. So there is going to be uh, voice commands and the, the robot has to understand the voice commands. There is going to be some amount of artificial intelligence involved because typically we'll have to build all the standard operating procedures either into the robot or we will have it in the cloud. And from the cloud, certain specific instructions will flow to the robot. And of course, there is going to be cybersecurity. I'll briefly touch on it. And it looks like it's going to be an interesting field and it is going to open up a lot of opportunities for youngsters. So they should also watch out what they can do and how they can make a career in this. Now we have planned that we will have a pilot, first pilot robot, and uh, maybe within probably a year span, we will have it working. This robot will move in a fixed environment. So we will have a fixed environment. We'll define the boundaries of where the robot is moving. We may have a pilot setup available, which will have some balls, which will have some gauges. And the robot will go and operate these balls and read those gauges. There may be some LED LCD meters, so the robot will go and read them. So here we are not going to use any digital system to communicate and pass on the values, but the robot is going to see like a human being sees uh, numbers on a, on, on, a, on a meter. He is going to see the numbers or he's going to see a dial and he's going to say what is the reading. And then he's going to pass this reading onto the system. Record the values. So typically we will find, we'll just transmit it by Wi-Fi to some database and record it for our program purpose. And maybe we can have some automatic operation. Now, this is basically a long-term vision that in which will probably take a year or so. And we are announcing the first project in our this, this month edition. And the first project is going to be like a competition and many people and many teams and many companies, many student teams can participate. It's going to be a very simple project. You are going to have to identify walls, gauges, meters. So typically, uh, normally it's just an image classification project and there are many such projects available. There are many tools available online which can make it happen very, very easily from AWS or SEO. And we are not limiting, you're not saying that you have got to make your own Python program or CNN or whatever. You can go and use this AI cognitive tools that are readily available and make this project a success. So because this being the first simple project, we want it to happen very fast. And we are announcing this in our next uh, edition. And I request all of you who are an enthusiast, who are in industry, the industry students to participate in large numbers and make this a success. And if we go ahead and uh, I'll briefly touch upon the subject of cybersecurity for robots. See, we have got a cybersecurity standard for ISA for uh, which is also an IEC standard, ISA IEC 6243, which is used for typically all the PLCs and uh, TCSs and things like that. But now when we are talking about this humanoid kind of robot, which is going to use a lot of AI from the cloud or uh, from other places, there's going to be a lot of exchange of data, there is exchange of uh, information, the robot is going to take some readings, it is going to hear some command, it is going to do some operation. There is always small operation that is possible. Like uh, Rohit briefly touched about UAW having built-in cybersecurity. You need to think about having cybersecurity for the robot. And there are going to be much many more aspects of cybersecurity than we have previously put for PLCs and TCSs and things like that. Where we have created different levels and we are saying, okay, we are going to have a demilitarized zone here. We are going to have, you know, uh, uh, a patch map server here like that. So here, there is going to be something called ethics and integrity of robo. We are going to have discerning robot, which means that supposing somebody says open the wall and at that particular point, the wall should not be opened. The robot should be able to understand that if I open this wall, there is going to be an incident that could be, there's a possibility of a safety incident. So I don't want to, at least, he has to communicate back and get a reconfirmation and then open the wall. So there are going to be certain different parameters that are going to come up when these robots come for field operator and maybe are going to have more and more intelligent robots. And that is going to add a new dimension to this standard. So there's potential here for students, for enthusiasts to literally build a new standard 
based on the existing one. So it's going to be easy. You don't have to start from scratch, but you need to build something new and uh, something that is going to be of value to the community. And you need to keep on adding for the maybe next 15, 20 years, the standard will evolve. So there is a whole career that can be built from right now. A student who is in final year can build a career and he can sustain it till the end of his career and probably beyond that also, but at least he can sustain it till the end of the career. So this is a very interesting subject and I'm very, when I'm very optimistic about this particular thing. And uh, saying so, I will stop my brief presentation and I thank you all for attending and I thank the organizers for yeah. having me. Yeah. Thank you, Anand. Uh, really wonderful and uh, special thanks for uh, keeping the time and making it short and effective. Uh, I, I think uh, already the time has overshoot, but I request all the audience and speakers to be with us with uh, some more patience. And uh, we have maybe a, a discussion. Uh, I request uh, Jamkar sir uh, to again uh, come up with his uh, advice on this and then people can ask some more questions. And Tushar and uh, all these speakers we have presented. And some questions already we have received. Uh, maybe I can later on add. Sir, I had a question and I sent it on the chat box actually. Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I have seen yeah, some... Answer. Maybe subsequent is also okay. But if you, uh, if you ask, it, it will save the time. Can you please ask because... Uh, there are several questions and selecting one may be time consuming. Uh, my question was to, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Rohit, uh, yes. about the methane gas leakage sensors. Huh. If you can answer. Yeah, Rohit, Sorry. this question, is this question was for you. You mentioned about some uh, methane gas uh, leak detection uh, sensors. Just wanted to know about that. Yeah, Ms. Kinsel is asking the question. I request Rohit to unmute the mic and for any other panel My members. My next question is to Mr. Tushar. Is there application oh. related to pharma industry what you showed the video? Uh, so the second video that I shown uh, was related to pharmaceutical, not pharmaceutical uh, factories, but pharmacies like a medical store, as as we call them in India. Uh, when you go to a medical store to buy uh, some medicine, it's related to uh, retail medical okay, shops, delivery, pharmacies, retail, retail delivery systems. That's correct. Yes. Have you done anything in the pharma industry in the production side? Uh, no, I mean, I've not done anything on the pharma production side. No, not really. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Deshmuk, you can get that answer from Rohit uh, on the email also. I have my email ID put yeah. there. Yes, yes, I have. I can share. I Thank request Jankar sir also to uh, say something after. Uh, Mr. Mangesh, the... are they there still or he's left the meeting? No, I think uh, he got some other meeting, so he okay. may join. Okay. Fine, fine, yeah. fine. Uh, does anybody have any question for me? Yeah. Ajay? Yeah, I, I think there are... Uh, Ajay, uh, I would recommend if anybody has any questions, they come to you and you can make sure those questions go to the personal panel members and they can respond back. Yeah. Yes. Actually, these questions are general questions, but somebody can... Uh, I think sir can answer. There is some uh, question like little is needed for humans in manufacturing, uh, and how are robots better than human workforce? This is a common question, and it's a generalized Amit, question. And it's a general I'm... question, so anyone can answer. Amit yeah. uh, Murgu is the name of the. The only thing that I would just want to uh, reiterate is about. In 1700s, we had the scenario where we replay, I mean, the production and machine manufacturing uh, machine have replaced uh, all the certain kind of handmade methodologies that we had been using. So I would just say that there, uh, there, there will be, there will be some impacts, but 
there will be also some positive impacts. We need to embrace them and we need to turn around them because we are the ones who are creating this uh, robotics. So we know how we can mold ourselves and uh, make sure that we work and we keep uh, running ourselves, working for the you know companies that we are doing. So, anyways, I, I just need to uh, yeah, yeah. part of the. Yeah, I, can, I can add from something from surgery. Yes. All those repetitive, monotonous jobs can be done by a robot better. Let us say yes. we are transplant. In hair, individual hair follicle is removed and then put it in the donor, say recipient. And you have to yes. put at least 30,000 hair. Yes. And so it's monotonous, boring, and uh, maybe very time consuming. So nobody can do that. So a robotic, that machine I showed, are it can uh, take pick up a hair and implant, pick up a hair and implant, and it does it nicely because it doesn't get bored, it doesn't get uh, bothered about yeah. monotony, and then it does yeah. fast. So I yeah. think uh, yeah. this can be extrapolated everywhere that anything yeah. monotonous, repetitive, can be better done by a robot. Yes. Thank you. I mean, and I'd uh, like to build on I mean, that. Uh, I'd like to build on that yeah. to add that when some job is monotonous and repetitive, there is a chance that uh, when a human operator is doing that, uh, after the point they will uh, make errors because it's repetitive and boring, whereas robots, uh, they are machines, so there's a very less chance of error. Uh, uh, again, whether uh, robots are more efficient, I think each business use case, uh, the business owner has to evaluate for a given situation, is robot a use of robot more efficient for them versus using, using human labor? Like I mentioned, currently for grocery, uh, in India, labor is cheap. So, you know, it may not be efficient to use robots right now, but uh, as you can see, in 10 years time, human labor will be very expensive in India. And maybe 10 years later, it would make sense to use robots to pick groceries in India 10 years down the line. So again, it's a case by case basis assessment that has to be done. It's a big market, uh, you want to say, big business again. Yeah. yeah. We have Amir Umbrani also from Netherlands. Uh, could you say something on, uh, based on what we heard from the speakers and panel members? Uh, are you able to hear me and see me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Actually, I am uh, actually, this is my first time for the presentation of ISA. And uh, actually, I would first thank all of the panel members for their valuable presentation. And uh, yeah, I, I really liked all the presentations. But then uh, one specific question I have for, um, I guess, about the drones. So I guess uh, someone presented about the drones, right? Yeah. One of the panel members. Uh, so actually, uh, Amazon is, uh, um, I don't know if you have heard, Amazon is planning yep. to have drone delivery. Yep. So uh, can similar setup be done in India? Like in the, for example, uh, the Make in India campaign. Can we build our own drones to uh, help transfer or help uh, deliver stuff. Mm. Can I, Ajay, can I answer? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, actually, uh, drones could be used for drug delivery and uh, say delivery of healthcare. Uh, okay. We have used drones in uh, Nashik Kumbh Mela. Now in okay. a Kumbh Mela, uh, millions of people come and then it is mm -hmm. impossible for any doctor to go to that site. So we had two drones, and they, they were specifically flown to the site where the patient required thing, and then the life was saved. So I think that other thing is uh, suppose somebody has a heart attack, cardiac arrest, then the okay. machine is flown through drone, and then okay. uh, instructions available, and then it's a okay. simple thing, and then once you put that uh, mount that. Uh, a CPR machine drone on the chest, uh, remotely you could operate from the distance and then uh, the lives are saved. I think uh, in US everybody is sending uh, say CPR machine by drones. Even sometimes you require a defibrillator. Uh, so it shows that they are rescue based operations, what we do on drones, right? 
and the basic advantage of uh, so all this marketing and uh, everything is human value is enormous. So once okay. you consider consider cost, life being invaluable, we always mm-hmm. use robots for saving life. There we don't okay. consider the cost okay. because human Somebody lives is are important. Yeah. Somebody okay. is asking actually, Mr. Samir Professor Samir Gajgat is asking. Uh, have a provision of robotics based after 5 to 10 years of usage so how the robots will be recycled uh, recycled as waste that's that's a very good point in fact batteries yeah. which are used in robots are big batteries so that's something i think industries need to start thinking probably some of them are already but a lot of these uh, parts uh, i mean if you if you see the uh, okado robots for grocery which i had presented uh, these are uh, made up of parts which are reusable uh, going forward let's say the technology has evolved and now instead of a stm32 microcontroller you have now let's say a newer one five years down the line you could still uh, replace the internal circuit board uh, and use the whole chassis again so i think what industry needs to do is think about this problem which samir has very rightly highlighted and design the solutions up front which are future proof in terms of reducing waste yeah but I, uh, whether this uh, kind of uh, problem is addressed uh, at present or whether some thought process is going on maybe i want to listen from other uh, speakers also, Jamkar sir and Amir and uh, I think Michael, I... yeah, huh. yes. Ajay? Yeah, yes. So this may no, be... Uh, looking, looking at the complexities of uh, robots being used on, uh, say, floor or maybe for the machines and automotive, I think uh, those require complicated actions. And they require a lot of intelligence and a lot of uh, competencies co- in all those uh, robotics for uh, say, automotive industry. Compared to that, a robot wound surgery uh, won't require uh, much uh, much complexity because at the end, yeah. uh, as I said, it's a muscle movement. Yeah. And therefore, required is not very complicated. And they want uh, Indians to put their mind into it. That we need to create our own system. It's not... Uh, uh, it should not be that complicated. I think that much intelligence we have in India. Yeah. Any uh, so there are movements. They are handling. So you, if you can see, there are four or five types of movements at a particular joint, and then forward movement, backward movement. So all these uh, these things are not very very complicated. I think. Uh, yeah. I am thinking uh, you should look at the engineering angle how to create them. Yes, but maintenance of robots. Uh, uh, I will come back to Sandeep also. Uh, maintenance of such robots in medical as well as uh, uh, similar domains and also standardization of robot. These two issues are also not discussed much. So medical... So, uh, robots... in, medical in medical side, what they do with the biggest problem is all these robotic equipments which go inside the body are disposable. Okay. And that is the main cost of robotic surgery. A robot will cost around four or five crore rupees, but then each instrument set will cost at least three to four lakh rupees. Oh. So um, what they do is they do intermediate technology, and because obviously they want to earn money, uh, the moment you use for one patient, it doesn't go for the second patient at all. Okay. So they so use what is called like intermediate yeah. technology that they don't uh, they don't just uh, uh, say declare that the patient is over. Okay. The same okay. instruments are again autoclaved, again done, and then uh, then second and third patient is done. But maximum so two or three. Yeah. So, so intermediate use technology. Use and throw type of. Uh, ah. So yeah. we create yeah. robot in India. We can have what is called as a permanent instruments. So simple thing now we have got something called staplers. Yes. Now yeah. there are disposable staplers and reusable staplers, say reloadable staplers. Yes. So all those staplers which are reloadable, they are cheap because yes. the disposable. Yes. You you apply ten sutures, it goes away. Whereas a yeah. reusable, there is a cartridge available. So I think why what we need to think as an Indian manufacturer is to create uh, what is called as cartridge for uh, these uh, robotic equipments, yes. so that yeah. the disposable thing can be done and then it can mm-hmm. put inside. So I think, uh, we need to think in uh, Indian way. 
what yeah. is called as yeah so anand uh, anand you want to say something on this uh, use and throw robots in medical field and uh, some robots could be again uh, retrofitted in industry no no whole robot is not throwable only okay. equipments some part of that no yeah, equipment that is going inside the body yeah, yeah. sandeep you want to say something on this like industrial robots are different than medical robots yeah so technology is already available but yeah. there are several other factors that impact implementing these applications one is the regulations there are so many fa regulations that we need to follow and make sure that we are abiding with those regulations if we violate those regulations then they will be confiscated the drones or if it yeah. is coming to medical surgery they will be uh, like whatever the bots that are in the medical surgery field they will be confiscated so we need to make sure that yeah. that's strengthened out make sure that okay we have tested it in india and it it was successful so that should come out secondly it's all about do we have the network infrastructure or the capability to make sure that these applications are going to work so every country has their own network infrastructure the strength of the network infrastructure should be one of the factors that is creating an impact i would say because at this point i would say still in some rural areas or some area, parts of india i'm pretty sure the network is not that strong enough and if you want to do a robotic surgery it's not going to happen so we need to make sure that all these certain criteria which are there which are aiding us should be taken care of before we implement any such technologies in india yes thank you samir gajrate uh, can you ask us whatever you want to say he has very interesting question actually uh, i request jamkar sir and uh, kushar to answer hello sir i am not, not clear about as, what as regards the as regards the regulation is concerned uh, india is uh, still developing now all yeah. these equipments are still out of law uh, 2021 yes. uh, december they will come under <coughs> say gadgets and at present they are not under fd <coughs> i know all this because that our our machine that we have created for say dispensing drug can be used without getting fda approved yes but it so, it is under fda so i think yeah. there were one more year or maybe two years going on by the time um, the whole the uh, law will be yeah so at present we can try yeah. we want to know from ushar and uh, amir also about uh, regulation in their own country but uh, uh, samir does uh, not want to ask uh, some question which is interesting sir actually so I... hello right hello hello please please ask you okay sir actually whenever the robots are uh, uh, prepared in now uh, nowadays the we have to think about the three angles whether that will be the reactive purpose uh, then the maintenance part then the wastage parts because nowadays we are preparing the newest technology for the betterment of the human life but uh, the people are not looking towards the, these three type uh, three sides of the robots uh, for the environmental base uh, and other things so i would like to know the uh, whether these three uh, areas uh, where uh, while preparing the robots whether this research has been carried out or yet to be uh, yet not done this work Yes, sir. So I, I can yeah. add to my two bits. Yeah. Uh, basically, t- uh, in uh, applications such as grocery, which I mentioned, the first part uh, of uh, the first prototype, the, 
the whole idea is to get the proof of concept working and show to the industry that you know this is a feasible concept so here um, a lot of uh, learning comes in in terms of you know uh, there's a wear and tear in this particular motor for example or when you go and lift the basket in the z direction uh, there's a flat flexible cable that is used and we observe that you know this cable snaps a lot and that costs a lot of money i think so, typically uh, with all all things of such sort it's an iterative process you make a prototype use it uh, you have your learnings out of it and then uh, when you go on to the second and the third iteration you keep on getting better at you know reusing parts minimizing waste um, and then industry starts asking you questions like you know how, what have you thought about battery disposal etc and then after the second and third iteration you are in a position to you know address these concerns so uh, i think slow and steady we will get there where you know we would be uh, and presumably people have already started uh, thinking about these things like okay how to reduce waste how to reuse parts etc these are my two cents on this yeah abhi uh, you have any idea about what is the status in netherlands and similar countries I think, as far as I know, the EU regulations on robotics is uh, not very strict right now. They have regulations on uh, medical robotics, for example, uh, like the robotics uh, we use in surgical, surgical robots, for example, and uh, also uh, all the equipment should be EMC compliant. So that's what I know. but not specifically yeah. anybody else from in fact samir has highlighted another interesting point which is to do with uh, the operating yeah. temperature of these robots so by fiber parts what exactly do you mean samir is it the the body of the robot the internal parts of the robots yes yes uh, body of the robots because reinforced fibers uh, whatever they use at the low temperature the electrostatic charges are uh, developed on the surface of that body so it is harmful when the, we are do performing the uh, operations so this is for medical industry i think uh, dr jamkar is better suited to address that but my, uh, i would i like to add the robots which we use in the grocery industry we use them even in the chill section the chill section is where where you store your it's a minus 20 degree operation where you have your sweet corn frozen items ice um, chilled items ice cream etc and we have robots working in uh, the chill section as well which is minus 20 degree operation and uh, these things have been taken into consideration the motor operating temperature the pcb and the sensors that we have selected are able are able to cope with such operating temperatures and i would imagine such similar care has been taken in fact these medical robots are as dr jamkar mentioned 4 crores 5 crores so these things would have been uh, factored in but i'd like dr jamkar uh, add his own comments yeah. on this yeah there are uh, some participants from medical field also um, so they can ask also ask question to dr jamkar sir no uh, we uh, we have robots available for uh, what is the radiation uh, zone where uh, people cannot enter and uh, something happens uh, suppose uh, there is a x ray deep x ray therapy is being given there is so much of radiation available so handling all those equipments uh, we have robots available but as i said all these robots are very elementary they don't they uh, they don't have any high tech uh, uh, technology available so these are reasonably available i think uh, on similar basis uh, bomb squads and all that they are using robots for defusing bombs on similar basis you can do that yes any other question from uh, maybe medical students or medical practitioners who are with us uh, ajay sir can i ask one question yes definitely Uh, as a student, I was uh, doing my masters uh, in one of the universities in Netherlands. Yeah. And our robotics and mechatronics department had a nice uh, MRI compatible robot. So yes. we used mm-hmm. MRI for breast biopsy. Uh, so my question is to Mr. Arun Jamkar. Uh, are there any uh, MRI uh, MRI compatible robots in India, uh, which we are directly using in the, one of the hospitals right now? No, no, we don't have any MRI compatible because, as you said, uh, it's mm-hmm. a big problem. 
to get any equipment in MRI area. So yes. we have you know, stethoscopes which are MRI compatible. Because okay. sometimes it becomes serious. You, you have to intubate. You have to mm -hmm. resuscitate. Everything is what is called as MRI compatible, which is okay. non metallic things available. But uh, okay. obviously, we don't have any robots for that. But maybe this okay. is an blind spot for all of you to do something. Because those yeah. robots, you have to make it for plastic, high grade plastic, which are. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, there is a good it, question from. Uh, all components need to be plastic. Yeah. There is a very good question from Anaga. Uh, any role of robots uh, in physiotherapy? Obviously, there is a lot of role in physiotherapy because when you train a robot to do uh, actions, uh, it can be um, it can be mim by uh, imitated by uh, a patient. So, uh, at present, I am using Xbox, which is a gesture-based technology, where uh, all the physio say exercises are being shown to me by a robot. And obviously. It is a uh, video of a robot. So every time uh, you have to just follow that robot. I think on similar basis, you could create a robot, um, but which is programmed. And then uh, you need to have all those actions because at the same time, as we rightly said, people get bored. And uh, same patient, same movement every day, they get bored. So you can do, uh, we can create a robot for physiotherapy. Yes. Thank you, sir. Any other question from participants? Uh, Something I'm seeing in the chat box, but Hello? yeah, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good. Uh, 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 my question is uh, towards use of medical technologies and robotic uh, uh, robotic uh, usage in medical field, um, along with automation system. So, on a scale of one to ten, uh, in India right now, uh, what what exactly is the state of uh, usage of the medical robots? Uh, at present, uh, robots are being used in surgery, as we've sh shown. Then, uh, most popular thing is uh, Dave Ancy, my institute. I think we are around uh, 50 to 90 robotics available in India. And now the Medtronics is coming in big way because they are coming with a modular robots, but they are uh, still to get an FDA assurance, happens uh, approval by uh, government, US government, but that will come. But uh, now for the knee replacement, hip replacement, I think they are very common. Maybe uh, there might be at least a uh, thousand various uh, uh, robotics available for knee replacement, say joint replacements. I think overall the penetration is very good. And uh, we are a very peculiar country. Uh, we are not poor. Uh, we offer highest degree of technology that is available in West to every patient in India at the cost. It has to be, in, it need to be affordable. But then everything is available in India. That's why all big uh, five-star hospitals will have everything uh, that we have said. Yeah, there is some interesting uh, question. What is wearable robot? So wearable, uh, uh, what, what is the interpretation of wearable robot? Maybe again, I can ask Jamkar sir to say something on this or Ameya is there. I think Ameya has written this question or somebody else has written for Ameya. Or Tushar, anyone? Uh, so actually, I'll just elaborate the question or, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, one more field of robotics is soft robotics, which is uh, growing rapidly, at least in Europe. I don't know about India. So soft robotics is like part of robotics where you mimic uh, a function of an animal, for example. Uh, yeah. so maybe you have heard about the continuum robots. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yes. So basically, you use uh, pneumatic actuation for uh, actuating the robot. So you make a nice channel and then you pour some air into it. And uh, so right now I've shared a link which is used for therotic purpose. So basically if you have muscle pain or joint pain, so you just wear the device and 
so it will sense so the uh, it will get emg signals from the 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 body it will acquire the emg signals from the body so basically they act as a pain receptor on, and based upon the pain they will uh, they will actuate so the amount of uh, pressure you put it depends upon the pain yeah. so that's a nice application of uh, soft robotics yeah. and it's uh, used also for locomotion so the places where you can't go, where the robot can't go for example very tiny thin tubes where the robot can't go for inspection you just send the soft soft robot it will adapt the size of the, of the tube or the object and it will go inside and do inspection yeah. so that's the right uh, application of soft robotics yeah. these days yeah in audience there are uh, raj shekhar and uh, chitnis sir they want to ask anything uh, either to jankar sir or uh, tushar or me uh, or amir uh, or anybody from the panel group so if you dump it to say something on the future uh, future of this robotics and then perhaps we may conclude if there are no question but what will be the future of robotics in industry as well as in uh, medical field i think uh, all these robotic surgery uh, which is at present uh, a just connection between uh, moving arms and the console where the surgeon is sitting outside now we can have ai system developed in sense uh, suppose i am dissecting uh, an area of the appendix or liver so uh, there has to be an, a, what is called as a, a conglomeration of videos of anatomical sites available and then uh, the ai system can guide you and then it can suppose i am dissecting something uh, uh, if if i follow to the normal anatomical norms then it it will say okay otherwise uh, it will guide you uh, with all the you know, all these are available with the ct scan mri and everything so all these things are available and they can direct you to proper surgery so tomorrow uh, if you want uh, i can show you one video of uh, what is called as the feature of medicine uh, which is very fantastic it's in a film called uh, passenger which is uh, aircraft which is traveling for 100 years and then suddenly one somebody becomes unconscious they send to a uh, cabin called auto doc and then the auto doc is everything it diagnoses it treats and everything uh, if you want i can show that video yes uh, if it is there we we can see the video now okay wait a minute yeah audience can tell us whether can you see are... can you see yeah it's coming up now so this is a patient now this is a jennifer lawrence and then is diagnosing taking all the the patient is unconscious it injecting and patient is live can you see that did you see this ajay 
yeah actually the video is shared with the participants uh, i will not, I, i will confirm with somebody whether they are able to see the video but you you are not able to see <coughs> no there are two station one uh, it is seen on other computer and in my computer we are managing something else here so it is seen on in the other room but i want to confirm it from participant whether they are able to see it ah uh, yeah now it is coming yeah it is coming on my computer also now so this is future of medicine yeah So it seems to be a very high end technology and a lot no, of no it is a movie it yeah. is a movie but then you know the mobile pattern was shown in star wars star wars <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Miskin sir, uh, could you throw a light uh, on whether such kind of robotics uh, maybe could be manufactured in in any advanced factory? In some cases, we find that. technology is available in some cases we find that manufacturing challenges are there or tushar can you throw a light on this sorry i missed that what was it so to one end we see that the technology is ready and applied areas are to be identified in other case there are if you see the future robots shown by dr jamkar then those robots are to be manufactured people are to be trained so there are so many challenges yeah so Maybe there's a point be, there's a bridge yeah. that has to be uh, there's a gap which has to be bridged and uh, i think it's again on a case by case basis industries and applications uh, have to evaluate um, the uh, investment versus benefit that they bring in at the end of the day it's all business so everyone has to evaluate what benefit they get out of using robots for example for this level of surgery and again uh, the technology has to develop as well so it's a path which we have to you know uh, take and reach there in years time as dr jamkar mentioned mobile phones was a fictional item 20 years 30 years ago uh, maybe 40 years ago in star wars but now everyone's using it so it It's the same thing with what we see today as fiction will be reality 20 years down the line yeah thank you i, I just want to request dr damkar sir to have a concluding remark on this so that what our people should look for in future definitely this kind of programs we arrange next time it will be more focus on particular sector i could not cover agriculture sector but even industry sector medical sector that itself is so huge that we need maybe so many panel discussions and of course industry Uh, need to come forward to do all these things and we have to create a lot of awareness for the society as far as the user users of sort of guidelines and some certification issues and some technological issues all are together and it seems to be even the ro robotic is developed to this extent in automotive and in medical field but there are lot many things to come up so uh, i request uh, dr jamkar sir to give concluding remark and then what uh, we should look for what is the motivation for next programs and next uh, industry activities and after that i will request uh, professor goite ma'am from our institute to uh, say few words about this and say what of thanks so that we can conclude the session uh yeah ajay shall yeah i talk uh, let me first uh, congratulate uh, you and uh, your college and dr bapert for organizing yeah. a wonderful yeah. webinar yeah. and uh, proud tire to cities 
and nobody will say that it is organized from Fulton. Everybody starts asking yeah. what is the connectivity in this and that, and I must commend you for yeah. taking this uh, the venture ahead. So uh, let us let us give you a big hand, whatever people we have, so we can have what's called digital hands available. Now, uh, yes. my aim always has been to sensitize engineers and doctors in this field. Now, this is a field of medical instrumentation and all our uh, healthcare costs are very high because all these equipments are, uh, say, invented, researched, and manufactured outside India in Western societies where they pay people uh, eight, uh, eight pound an hour. That's why everything is very costly. So what we need to do is develop all of them in India so that the cost of healthcare goes down. I think this is my precise aim. So either you can do the reverse engineering or maybe some parts which are there. So that uh, now I was associated with uh, uh, a government of India enterprise called SAMI, where I had helped them to develop an Indian MRI. Yeah. And instead of MRI being uh, 10 crore rupees, the Indian MRI would cost maybe around one and two crore rupees. Yeah. So I think we are, uh, let, my, let us be proud. We are the most intelligent species in the world. Yeah. And we run Western societies. So why not run our own societies, um, giving yeah. all our knowledge available? So say uh, there is a lot of thing available under Modi. There are a lot of startups. So we need to just think, think network, uh, consult with each other, consult with medical group, consult with engineering group, and do some new things so that the, the, the technology will help and it will reduce the cost of health. And uh, I just compliment yeah. to your college for organizing this and uh, exposing me to an entirely a new world. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. I just want to recollect on this occasion that you were a uh, guest of honor during the validatory function in IIT Bombay. Yeah. And uh, MRI, which you are saying, is uh, made by Professor Arjun Arunachalam. Yeah. He left the professor's job and he went to Singapore and then he came to India. Yeah. He did it in uh, Bangalore in Satya Sai Baba Hospital. And uh, another MRI also it was developed in Samir. And uh, I hope through our joint efforts, many things are happening and the low cost indigenous development well as applied areas are also getting addressed. And our course, uh, clinical engineering and imaging technology, I think this is what uh, we are working on so that people, they collaborate and come together. So we found that technology universities, then uh, this medical health universities as well as agriculture universities. Now there should be a top level coordination, uh, which is essentially required along with industry. So maybe in coming uh, same, uh, panel discussions as well as for some activities, we need your guidance. Uh, we are really delighted to have your presence here. Uh, everybody is invited to uh, see uh, something new and the, the kind of future which uh, you have addressed. And uh, Tushar and uh, uh, other people, including Amir and the uh, uh, robotics people, they have also mentioned Akkad from our Akkad division. So it was really very good. And uh, I, I think your, your uh, guidance and uh, your support is definitely helpful to all of us and as the motivating. Uh, so it is just a big motivation to all of us. So thank you, sir, for thank your presence. And we'll uh, come back to you again for similar programs. Yeah, I request Bhoiti, madam, to uh, continue, uh, say a of thanks and Hello everyone. A really great session was this. Uh, so uh, we got uh, information about robotics and automation. Uh, really interesting uh, session. Uh, so uh, on the behalf of College of Engineering Fulton, I would like to uh, thank all the uh, members uh, who involved in this discussion. Uh, uh, respected Dr. Arjun, Arun Zamkar sir, uh, Tushar Agarwal sir, and who all are present here, uh, respected Dilip Miskin sir. So, uh, thank you all for giving such a nice information to all our uh, staff. Thank you again. Thank you, Deshmukh sir, also. Thank you so much. Thank you.
uh, are you have you are you recording this yes sir. yes yes we have recorded it and we'll send you the copy okay thank yes. you yes thank you sir thank you so let us call the day yes so uh, what we have done is we have taken uh, enough time in order to cover the subject normally time limits are there in every panel discussion but today we thought that all the subjects are to be very clearly elaborated and therefore we took liberty to have some more time so already 9 o'clock was the time to conclude the meeting but i have taken liberty to have 45 minutes again so we have also appreciated yeah i i just volunteer for all indian engineers yes to help them in whatever way i yes. have in fact uh, uh, some sort of thought leader and or can say advisor to lot of companies i am yes. advisor to a company called rises where yeah. uh, working on ai based system for diagnosis of uh, corona by uh, x ray chest okay. so um, i work with a lot of companies yeah. so anybody who want to develop a robot or anything i am there to help them yeah. thank you thank you sir thank you thanks thanks everyone thank you sir thank you atushar thanks thank you amir thanks to sandeep and all the accord members isa international society of automation automatic control and robotic division thank you so we close the meeting and we meet again sometimes as if uh, whenever it is possible thank you sir brilliant thanks bye bye yeah thank you bye thank you, thank you.